You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Hello everyone and welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I am Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you the very best Christian scholarship and apologetics. And today we're talking about a topic we haven't really talked about for a while. I think last time we might have explicitly talked about this was back with Rob Bowman in 2013. But it's one we should talk about more often. I mean, we have had shows on Christology and such, but view on the topic of the Trinity. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about how important the Trinity is, what difference it makes. I mean, that, that could include an apologetic defense of it, but also just how we live the Trinity. And to do that, I've brought on M. James Sawyer, author of a book, Resurrecting the Trinity. He got his BA from Biola in 1973. He got a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary in, in New Testament in 78, and he went on to get a PhD from there in 87 Historical Theology. He has published numerous books and articles and contributed to them as well, and is the author of a book, Resurrecting the Trinity. So, uh, Dr. Sawyer, welcome to the Deeper Waters podcast. Nick, thanks for inviting me to be on. Mm -hmm. Now, if my audience doesn't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to be doing what you're doing? Well, uh, I have been a professor in colleges and seminaries since 1984, and uh, in I was about 10 years ago, I left my full-time position and, oh, and started a ministry where now I teach overseas uh, several times a year at places uh, where they do not have ready access to good, solid uh, biblical and theological scholarship. Mm -hmm. Now, today we're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. I've... Uh, had this view for a while, and you can see what you think about it. You know, this can be a good jumping off point that a lot of the uh, churches you'll find today, you have confessing Trinitarians, practicing Arians, and when they evangelize, they become modalists. About the only time we ever do anything with the Trinity is when the Jehovah's Witnesses come by and we get the Trinity out of a box to beat them up, and then off they go again. <laughs> Yep, that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason that I wrote the work on the Trinity is that uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, I have been deeply involved studying the uh, early church fathers up through the Council of Nicaea and come to understand that the Trinity was at the very center of their theological understanding. And uh, everything was viewed through the lens of the Trinity, and at the center of the lens is the incarnate person of Christ. Mm -hmm. We, as Western Christians, don't do that. Uh, we put something else at the center. If it's the Reformed tradition, uh, it's the sovereignty of God, the glory of God, uh, some will put predestination there. Justification by faith. Justification by faith, very definitely. Uh, and that, that particularly uh, is characteristic of the Lutheran center. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the Wesleyan, or rather the Arminians, uh, as Christians are emphasizing human freedom, and the uh, uh, Wesleyan Arminians emphasize uh, sanctification or holiness. And all of those systems uh, arose out of reaction to what was being experienced by the church at that time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ancient church took almost three centuries to work out a doctrine of the Trinity. And 
not, not saying that they did not start out believing in the Trinity. They did, but they didn't have a way to explain it, and that is what led to the early councils of the Church. Yeah, now, to be sure, of course, when we talk about all these things that we put as sinner, we're not saying any of these things are right or wrong, or bad things or unimportant things. They're just not what is the main theme of a Christian faith, right? Yes, well, the yes, that's what I'm saying. The historic Christian faith, mm -hmm. as coming out of the ancient church, put the person of God and the person of Christ at the very center of their understanding. Mm -hmm. And they understood this in a very relational, personal way, whereas we in the West, uh, we tend to treat our theology much more abstractly mm -hmm. and uh, at, at least arm's length from what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I was also thinking that I don't know how many times I've been to church services and if anything's at the center many times, it's usually just pure personal application. And mm -hmm. when the pastor will give an altar call, it'll be along the lines of, God, I want you to take me to heaven when I die. And I'm sitting here listening to this every time thinking, you know, I somehow think the whole purpose of Christianity is a whole lot more than take me to heaven when I die. I would agree wholeheartedly. I think that is most unfortunate that we have lost our our center mm -hmm. and the the center is participation well the the person of god and then extend that a bit it is participating in the life of god mm -hmm. both now and for eternity mm -hmm. so it, it seems kind of ironic because you have been saying all of our sermons too often are just personal application but yet at the same time part of what we're missing with Trinity is personal application, but then I think that personal application does have to flow from the theology, and we just don't understand the theology at all. Yes, I would agree with that, Nick, except I'd go a step further. Mm -hmm. I would say that the theology needs to be not just abstract propositions that we believe in our head, right. but it needs to be a reflection of the relationship Mm -hmm. that we have uh, with the persons of the Trinity. Yeah. Now, I'd say, for instance, like if I'm uh, trying to convince someone giving arguments for God's existence, I mean, I'd be the first to say, I mean, but, yeah, okay, this argument is not going to take you to the Trinity, but it will take you to theism. And so, yeah, we can all say things that we all agree about God, but I think it's been said that Christians don't need to just be monotheists. We have a unique form of monotheism that isn't found anywhere else. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The monotheism of Judaism and Islam is absolute monotheism that does not allow for the uh, reality of God being more than mm -hmm. person. Yeah. No, I, I just spoke about the philosophical argumentations and such we can make, and that's a very important because so many times, I think, for those of us who are very philosophically minded, we lose sight of the fact that our philosophy really needs to be informed by what we find in Scripture. And the Trinity didn't just come because where a bunch of Catholics were really bored one day and decided they'd make up some strange doctrine. <laughs> but it... it <laughs> Yeah, I, as someone once told me, the Trinity came because the Pope was smoking mushrooms one day. I, I, I don't <laughs> kid you that. Someone really told me that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the Trinity... Well, what? Yeah. The Trinity comes uh, before there is a Catholic Church, although right. the Catholic Church rightly claims an unbroken line, but so does the Orthodox Church. And the Trinity comes when the Orthodox and the Catholic Church are still a single body. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Trinity also comes, we must say, because we had to answer the question, what do we do with Jesus? Because we thought, look, okay, we agree with Jews. There is one God, but, you know, this Jesus person, he seems to be God, but the Father seems to be God also. And then we got this Holy Spirit here. What do we do? Yep, that's exactly right. And that's the questions that the early church wrestled with for the first three centuries. Mm -hmm. The apostles in the New Testament 
uh, recognize the deity of Christ, but they don't explain how Christ could also uh, be God at the same time. Mm -hmm. And these first three centuries that uh, several uh, different uh, understandings of how God and Christ are related that are put forth, they kind of run up the flagpole and then shot down because the church recognizes there's an inherent weakness in whatever is being uh, proposed. And it is not until we get to the Council of Nicaea that uh, we get our full-orbed understanding of the Trinity as being uh, three persons in one essence. And the term that is embodied in the Nicene and Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed is homoousios, that the Son and Spirit are of the same essence or the same being. And this term, the term, uh, that term is in the Creed. The term that has been used to describe the relationship is perichoresis. Mm -hmm. That term comes a few centuries later, but it has, it has become the common term to explain the fact that the Father, Son, and Spirit are a dynamic interplay of love and that they indwell each other. Yeah. I've been a lifelong Star Trek fan, and so I, I like to use the illustration, when, like all of illustrations, it's very, very limited, of uh, the Father, Son, and Spirit are involved in a permanent Vulcan mind meld. <laughs> Uh, that they understand, they see, they experience what what each of them is uh, thinking, doing, whatever, uh, but without losing personal identity. I, I, I actually never caught on the Star Trek craze, although I have seen many of the recent movies. My wife's trying to get into the series. I, I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with some of my friends who are Trekkies now. <laughs> well, you have to go back and start with the original series back in the 60s and then watch all through <laughs> the the original and the second series. <laughs> That's what she's doing. She uh, she got into it because one of her favorite voice actors is in the series uh, Star Trek Continues, and she just really enjoyed that. Oh, great. Now, I, I like what you were saying also about the heresies that came up. I've been listening to my friend Kurt Geralds on his podcast, Veracity Here. He's been doing a lot of PhD research into the Eastern Fathers and such. And he, he did say something I think is very correct about people who formed these early heresies. That a lot of them weren't like these evil, wicked masterminds who were trying to lead the church to destruction and things of that sort. They were... People are trying to just understand what was going on, and they didn't realize the full implications of what they were saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, I mean, early on, and well, they, and also you have to understand the philosophical background too. Mm -hmm. You're in you're in a world that is in a philosophical background of Platonism, and then a little bit later on, Neoplatonism, mm -hmm. and becomes the the lens through which the uh, generations view reality, and it is not till the Council of Nicaea that the, the Church breaks out of that lens in their explanation of how we are to understand the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we should cover at least a couple of the heresies here, and one of the first ones is when we call modalism. Yes. And I alluded to this one here when I said that Christians are confessing Trinitarians, practicing mm -hmm. Arians, and proselytizing modal. It's because so often we may give an analogy of a Trinity, a man will say, well, I'm a husband, and I'm a father, and I'm a son. That's the way the Trinity is. And, mm -hmm. I, and I would think, congratulations, you've introduced someone to a heresy. <laughs> yeah, and that was, yeah, modalism or Sabellianism was one of the very, very, uh, prominent heresies uh, in the generation before the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. By the time of Nicaea, modalism had been rejected. Uh, but uh, it saw that the Old Testament, God was Father. In the Gospels, uh, God revealed himself as Son. And in 
uh, beginning with Pentecost, he has revealed himself as spirit, but he is uh, simply one undifferentiated unity. And, you know, it's like I am a husband, father, uh, a son and father. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have one person who's just switching modes, which is... Yeah, switching roles. Yeah. Let's okay, uh, Dr. Sawyer, why is that such a big deal? I mean, what do we really lose if that's the case? If that is the case, we do not... We have no assurance of our knowledge that we know God as he is in himself. Okay. Could you explain that? Yes, because God is putting on three masks, if you will. Mm -hmm. He is stepping into the, uh, kind of like the role of an actor. In the Old Testament, he's acting as God, uh, as the Father, God. In the uh, Gospels, he becomes incarnate and takes on the role of the Son. And after the, uh, and beginning at Pentecost, uh, he takes on the role of the Spirit. But we have no uh, assurance that we know who God is behind those three masks. Mm -hmm. We could get back to, again, the God of the philosophers, but that will only get you so far. Yeah, and it, it the God of the philosophers is also impersonal. Mm -hmm. Now, we can also, I think, see if there are some scriptural problems with this. I'm thinking immediately, for instance, one of my favorite ones to use, dear this is in John 8, when Jesus says, I am one witness, my father is another, which only makes sense if you have two different persons. I mean, something mm -hmm. just as simple as John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Yes, and so you very clearly in John 1 have two entities. Mm -hmm. And you get down to John 1, 18, the only begotten son or the only begotten God, depending on what, uh, what the... Um, translation is there of the textual problem in 118 mm -hmm. that who is in the bosom of the father he has and the word that is in greek is exegeo uh, the word for which we get exegesis and it is legitimate i believe to translate that he has fully explained who the father is right yeah, we could go to John. We could go to John fourteen as well. You know where you may remember that uh, Philip says, "Lord, show us the Father," mm -hmm. and uh, he says, basically, "If you have seen me, you have seen the Father." Mm -hmm. He say, "I am the Father," mm -hmm. and then through that whole uh, John fourteen through seventeen, you know we have a lot of. Uh, Jesus saying a lot of things about the Father and about the Father being in Him and Him being in the Father and we being, we being in Jesus, etc. Mm -hmm. And of course, that John, if Jesus is the Father, the great high priestly prayer of John, uh, of Jesus in John seventeen makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Is he praying to himself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is something a lot of atheists actually do say about the Trinity. <laughs> Which, all right, if someone's wanting a little bit more of a scripture between you, I did remember that. I did misspeak earlier. We had on the show uh, this year earlier, February 25th, Matthew Bates came on talking about his book, On the Birth of the Trinity. So that's another resource you all can go to for more information. Uh, when you, you mentioned John 14, I was thinking John 14 is a pretty good segue, I think, also into the other great heresy that came up of Arianism, which said yeah. the Son was not fully God, and he could be divine, but he's not fully God, and they did go to John 14, he said, John 14, 28, the Father is greater than I. Yes, at that point, we get into the distinction between what we would call uh, economic Trinitarianism and ontological Trinitarianism. Okay. Uh, they are two aspects, they're not two different types of Trinitarianism, but they, uh, those two concepts reflect uh, two different aspects of how we view the Trinity. Mm -hmm. That uh, ontological Trinitarianism, or the ontological Trinity, let's, let's not, because I think saying Trinitarianism is, uh, says more than what the term implies, but the ontological Trinity speaks of the eternal 
being of the Father, Son, and Spirit as homoousios and them in indwelling each other uh, in perichoresis. That speaks to the being uh, eternally. The economic trinity speaks of what we would call the job descriptions mm -hmm. of persons of the trinity. And before we have creation, we really don't speak of an uh, economic trinity, but economy speaks of what it is that the Father, Son, and Spirit do in the work of salvation. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that is the job description. The job description of the Son is to become incarnate and to sacrifice himself uh, for us and uh, to bring about, ultimately, the new creation. Mm -hmm. The job of the Spirit, then, becomes to indwell believers. And the job of, of the Father, he is the, shall we say, manager, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, who uh, participates, because what, the, what one person of the Trinity does, all are involved in. Mm -hmm. I like to use the uh, illustration that whatever God does, all of God does, but uh, that uh, in everything that God does, one of the persons of the Trinity is, if you will, the point man. Mm -hmm. And the other two are there, but they're in the background. Mm -hmm. Now, how would this also work uh, with the passage that we talk about one being greater than the other, but then also another one like say the all of it discourse where no one knows the day or the hour, not even the son, but the father, which would also imply the Holy Spirit doesn't know. Uh, that is generally explained by the fact of the that in the incarnation, Jesus limits himself right. mm -hmm. to uh, what we as human beings experience. So it's not that he does not have the ability to look forward, but that he has voluntarily limited himself to live out his life as a human being under the same limitations that you and I live. Right. But what, how would the Holy Spirit fit into that? Good question. <laughs> Uh, that And that's a question I have never addressed, actually. Uh, Jesus says that no one knows the Son but the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one knows the Father but the Son. And in that illustration or in that uh, verse, uh, Jesus is talking about the Father and Son. He doesn't talk about the Spirit. The Spirit uh, is in the background. And in fact, the uh, the early church referred to the spirit as the modesty of God, mm -hmm. that, that uh, he does not put himself forward. With reference to whether the spirit knew the time and the hour, you know, I will plead ignorance on that, but uh, the idea of subordinationism, that the son is uh, less than the father, is often tagged to that, that verse. Mm -hmm. um, there is no hint that the spirit, uh, that his knowledge is limited, but but there's also no uh, no statement that his uh, knowledge is unlimited. Um, but my understanding is that it is the self limitation of the son in his role as the, the true human being. That that's where that self-limitation takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, the spirit is not spoken of with reference to that. Anyway, maybe that can be like a blog post or something later on sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's uh, consider the, the Jehovah's Witnesses who come by. I mean, they're the ones today who are most Aryan in their thinking oh, and such. They're fully Aryan in their thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, Maybe if it's just kind of like an inner denomination or difference. I mean, does it really make a big deal to their salvation or anything if they don't hold to the Christology and the Trinitarianism that we do? 
they certainly cannot be consistent Christians and not hold to the Trinity. Uh, I've never had close, uh, close up, uh, inside and personal look at Jehovah's Witnesses. I've just focused on their their Aryan doctrine on the Trinity. Mm -hmm. But uh, from students that I have had, they appear to be very, very much works-oriented, that they're trying to earn their salvation. Mm -hmm. And uh, their salvation is not based in uh, the self-sacrifice of God himself to save them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that I find problematic. Uh, I mean, God is good, God is gracious, but uh, it is it is through Jesus as the as the Son that we come to Him. And if we do not understand Him to be one with the Father, you know, I think that that, that <sighs> well, I think that that is problematic. Let me. Um, move back to the early church here. Yeah, before you do that real quick, I would like to let people know that if you are interested in Jehovah's Witnesses, I did have Cynthia Hampton on my show on May 2nd, 2015. She is an ex-Jehovah's Witness, so if you want some more on that, you can go up. Now, what, what were you going to go to? Well, back, uh, back in the 4th century, in the time of the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople, uh, it was observed that Arianism, if you work it out, uh, it ultimately would reduce Christianity to morality, mm -hmm. rather to be a work of uh, a divine work of salvation. Mm -hmm. That that's the the presuppositions that Arianism uh, holds is that uh, that of course the uh, the Logos, the preincarnate Christ, is not. Uh, an eternal part of the Godhead. In fact, there is no Godhead. There is just God the Father. But uh, the Logos is created by the Father to, in turn, create everything else. So, uh, ultimately, the Logos is a creature who is called the Son of God as a title of honor rather than a title of being. Mm -hmm. he, is, he is a created being, not, uh, not an eternal being. And he is greater than creation because he created us, but he has nothing proper to do with deity. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very interesting that uh, the words of the Nicene Creed start out with, we believe in God, not the creator, but God the Father, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is a direct slap at Arianism. Because Arius says that God becomes Father when he creates, wow. when he creates Logos. But the Nicene Creed, and Athanasius uh, uh, speaks about this at length in his work on the Incarnation, which is, by the way, readily available uh, online. Mm -hmm. And anyone who is interested in the Trinity needs to read on the Incarnation. Mm -hmm. It's a very brief uh, but profound exposition of the relationship of the Father and Son. Mm -hmm. But that, that's, that is an aside here. Uh, Arius... Uh, preferred to call God the unoriginate. Mm. And uh, the Council of Nicaea said no, that uh, God is first and foremost Father. And the fact that he is Father also implies the eternal nature of the Son, because there never is a time when he is not Father. Mm-hmm. Even in an uh, understanding, of course, that before creation there is no time, but right. that that's an eternal relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, let's ask something else, like quick about the Council of Nicaea, because this is something that a lot of our atheist friends and such get wrong. <clears throat> this is something that even was got wrong with the Vinci Code, that we're told oh. that Jesus was decided to be God by a close <laughs> vote. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, 316 to 2, I think, that was that close vote. Did they have a recount? 
<laughs> Probably not. Uh, the everything that the Da Vinci Code says about uh, about the early church and uh, the place of Christ and uh, what happened at the Council of Nicaea is patently false. Mm -hmm. It's not just mistaken; it is patently false. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, we can show that the early church worshipped Jesus as God from the very first generation of uh, Christians. And the early church was much spent much, much more time defending the reality of Christ's humanity than it did uh, defending Christ's deity. Mm -hmm. Because the, uh, the early heresies in the first and second and third centuries uh, were um, docetism and Gnosticism, which denied that they uh, denied Christ's humanity. They said that he was uh, kind of like, to use a contemporary illustration, like a hologram. You could look and see and uh, even hear him but if you reached your hand out, your hand would kind of pass through him like a hologram. It would a hologram. I think and I've heard, for instance, that if you were walk walking, if Peter and Jesus were walking on the beach together, there was only one set of footprints yep. there. Yep, that's right. That's in one of the Gnostic Gospels. It escapes me at the moment which one. But yes, that's exactly right. And in fact, this is what the Apostle John is uh going after in John and first John one mm -hmm. that which we have seen with our eyes which our hands have handled we have heard which our hands have handled concerning the word of life mm -hmm. you know there was already during the lifetime of the Apostle John a denial of Jesus true humanity mm -hmm. we see John fighting back and he he calls a denial of Christ's humanity Antichrist mm-hmm no, I, I, there are so many people who I know get caught up in the whole debate on eschatology and such going about who is the Antichrist, who is the Antichrist, and I would say people are just, read what the text says, anyone who denies Jesus came in the flesh, that's mm -hmm. the Antichrist right there, he tells you. Yep, yeah, the scripture doesn't use Antichrist in the sense that we use it. No. And also, like what you said about how they spent more time trying to defend the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ, because for them it was kind of unthinkable that a good and holy God would take part in an evil material creation. And Craig Evans has even said he's concerned that the great danger of our churches today is not we deny the de deity of Christ, but we implicitly deny the humanity of Christ many times. Uh, uh, he may well be right there. Mm -hmm. Because we think of Jesus' humanity as somehow different from ours. Yeah. And that he did not experience the same, the same things that we experience. And that that is not the historic faith of the church. Mm -hmm. I remember having a professor one time, one of my philosophy professors said, if you had a, to choose on a basketball game one-on-one -on -one between Jesus and and Michael Jordan in his prime, who would you bet on? He said, you better bet on Michael Jordan. Yeah, he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus lived his life under the same limitations that we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't cheat and call and use his deity for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was saying when you talk about how that <clears throat> you're a church decide if you play Arianism to its logical conclusion, you just get moralism. And as soon as you are saying, wow, it's a good thing we don't have that problem in our church today. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we do, we, we may not have a theological moralism, but we do have a practical moralism because we don't work up the details of the relationship the, uh, that we have and that uh, salvation involves not just justification by faith, but that it is 
it involves participation in the life of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think too often we do have just that more. I think it's been called, and I think this is a segue into the next section about the false views of God that we have, just period. And to extent, of course, we all have false views of God. None of us have together, but one of them is just the, the moralizing God, as it were. <laughs> and that's what we got today as a sort of it's been called moral therapeutic deism, that God's there to make sure you're a good person, he gives you a little comfort when you're in pain, but other than that, mm. he's not very active with the world. Yeah, I think that was uh, Christian Smith's uh, was the one that uh, coined that. Uh, I think so. Coined that term. Mm. But yeah, moral therapeutic deism uh, has infected not only the general culture and its uh, view of God, but we find it in the church all over the place. Mm-hmm. And could you explain how you think we see it in the church? Well, uh, you know, we look at uh, a Christian lifestyle uh, basically as it, through the lens of morality. Mm-hmm. We look for healing through our through our therapists. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, I'm not saying that therapists cannot help us, but uh, we fail to see our relationship with uh, God through the indwelling Christ as the bottom line answer to the issues that we face. Uh, looking to all these other sources uh, for healing as opposed to the one who is the great physician. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we also have people, I liked how you took a shot at some of these people, where people who treat God as if he's a big genie just meant to grant their wishes, and, and talking about specifically people like Kenneth Copeland and these word of yes. safety shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just got back uh, last Sunday spending uh, a week in Ghana teaching a course in church history. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, my students who are pastors... Uh, in a, they're in seven or eight different countries. They were all complaining about you know, the uh, the radical uh, radical word faith, uh, name it and claim it Pentecostalism that has just taken such deep roots mm-hmm. in the African <laughs> church. Mm-hmm. And we we've got several Christians today who they would say word of faith movement is indeed wrong and dangerous, and they won't go as far as them, but I think too many of them also do have an idea of a God who, everything that happens in their life, it's it's all about me, it's God is trying to tell me something, there is some sign in what's going on, that everything apparently God does is all about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in a sense that by putting oneself radically at the center, they're treating uh, themselves as gods. Mm-hmm. Now, let's also talk about another false view of God, and one that's very prominent today, and that would be the one that's often found in Islam, for mm-hmm. instance, where you have a God, Allah, in Islam. He is indeed sovereign. He's mm-hmm. a judge, but you wouldn't really say he's loving. He gives you a list of rules to follow. And the reward for being a good Muslim isn't really intimacy with Allah or anything like that. It's more, hey, here's a bunch of versions. Have fun. Mm-hmm. Well, that is, that is of course, if, you know, you die as a martyr. That, right. Um, Islam over the, past, uh, over the past century has gotten a lot more radical than it had been for a number of centuries. But mm-hmm. Islam has always been spread by conquest. Right. Um, and in fact, when Islam first spread uh, in the 6th uh, uh, and 7th centuries, the, uh, the pagans, it was convert or die. With Christians, uh, because Christians were people of the book, they uh, they were encouraged strongly to convert, but it was not convert or die. It was uh, it was convert, or you are second class citizens, and you will be taxed heavily, and there'll be all kinds of limitations in society put on you. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, uh, since the time of the Crusades, however, the uh, there has been a much greater antipathy you know, between uh, Islam and Christianity. Mm-hmm. So how, how do, do you think that Islam's view of God, the way he is, does naturally lead into the way that Muslims live in, or what the Quran teaches? Uh, I think so, yes. It's uh, because he is absolute, he is sovereign. Islam actually in many of its uh, manifestations, is fatalistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and the term enshla uh, is if God wills, if God wills, if God wills. And they mm-hmm. they that all the time in the Islamic world. Uh, that it is God is the cause for Allah, which is, of course, just the, the Arabic name for God. Um, and it's related to the uh, L of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and uh, but he is uh, he is distant, he is utterly arbitrary, and uh, uh, well, I mean, we are seeing some of the problems of the radicalization of Islam mm-hmm. in the West today, and it, we're also seeing it in Africa. Um, yeah, the, on the uh, on the border between Christianity and Islam in Africa, because uh, the radical Islam is moving south, and uh, Christianity basically uh, encompasses most of uh, the southern part of Africa. Mm-hmm. Now, let, let's move on to how we get into the Trinity here, mm-hmm. and it, it's going to be sound very shocking to a lot of my fellow Protestant listeners when I. When I say this, because it sounds so unprotestant to say, but we often place such a huge emphasis on the Bible. And indeed, we should. We don't want to discount the Bible. But the purpose of a Bible is really to tell us not about the Bible, but to tell us about Jesus. That Jesus is the for greatest divine revelation of God. In fact, I often tell people I hesitate to describe the Bible as the Word of God, I prefer to use the term scriptures, which is what the scriptures themselves use, because mm-hmm. the Word of God is applied to Jesus. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you're right in that. It, uh, we do speak of the Bible as the Word of God, but uh, in scripture itself, uh, the Word of God is uh, is a reference to Jesus, and he is the eternal Word, living Word. Mm-hmm. And he is revealed through through, of course, the written word, but uh, but he is not locked between the uh, the covers of the book, mm-hmm. and sometimes that's the way we treat it. I I wonder if some of that's also behind. I've been actively involved in a whole lot of inerrancy debates and such. Mm-hmm. Um, this idea that some people have such a place everything so much on inerrancy that if there is one contradiction in the Bible or something where that's not true, where then the whole thing is false and Christianity is a sham. And and, and that is, that's absolute nonsense. Yep. Yeah, I I remember listening to uh, uh, Unbelievable of an atheist talking to a Christian on their kind of a a call-in show and saying where if we have two contradictory accounts of how Judas died, then how can we be sure of anything in the Bible? And I'm listening thinking, I don't know, maybe we could just oh, do history like we would of any other document? And no historical document gives all the details. Every historian chooses the details he in, uh, chooses uh, that he includes and the ones that he uh, does not put in because they are not uh, relevant to the point that is that he is trying to make. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the so-called contradictions fall right into that area. Mm -hmm. uh, That different people tell the same story differently, not one or the other is wrong. And all we have to do is to go into a courtroom and interview uh, a half a dozen people who saw an accident, and you'll get a half a dozen different so- stories 
and they all saw the same thing. Now, some passages that you go to, you know about how Jesus is so central. For instance, for Johannine Thunderbolt that shows up in Matthew, where he says that no one knows him except the Father, mm-hmm. and God's in fa- those to whom. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Yeah, Matthew means, 11, 27. Yeah, which is a way of saying that unless you know Jesus, you can't know the Father. And, That's right. And then talking to the Pharisees in John 5, the people who pretty much had PhDs in the Old Testament in his day, and saying, you have the knowledge of the Scriptures, that's good and wonderful, but... Uh, you're not properly following them because you don't know me, and since you don't know me, you don't know God. Yep, that's exactly what he says. Mm-hmm. That knowledge of the Scripture, as good as it can be, or as good as it is, um, is not the goal. Mm-hmm. The goal uh, is to go beyond to what the Scripture is talking about, to enter into that reality. Mm-hmm. Uh The Princeton theologian, B.B. Warfield, he died in, I believe it was 1921, at one point talks about how uh, the Bible is to be a window to allow us to see God. But we spend our time looking at the glass and looking at the, you know, what the the window is made of rather than using it for the purpose it was given. (laughs) Yeah, and we could never say that B.B. Warfare was someone who was light on Scripture. As far as I know, he's, back in, he's one of the architects of our modern understanding of inerrancy. He was known as Mr. Inerrancy, wasn't he? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, and uh, he was involved uh, in prosecuting Charles Augustus Briggs uh, for denying inerrancy uh, in the most famous series of heresy trials in the Presbyterian Church. And for anyone also interested, since this is an Apologetics podcast, when B.B. Warfare lists of things that are extremely important for a, a ministry to, ministers to know, high, high up on that list, Christian Apologetics. So if you're treating Scripture seriously, you're treating Warfare seriously, you have to treat Apologetics seriously. Yes, that's correct. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when what I just told you about, what I was just reading from your book about Jesus and how he uh, says you have to know him to know God. You know, I, I believe in all that. I hope that. But somehow when I say that, and I think it could be applied to many listeners and such, there seems to be something shocking about that. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, and I think that's a comment. That is a comment about how far we have strayed from the church's historic understanding. Right. Uh, that Jesus is the way to the Father. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, what we get, uh, well, that's so narrow, that's, you know, can God be, God can be known through the other, you know, all these other religions. And so, but uh, it is far different to have a personal knowledge than a knowledge uh, that is gained from looking, a personal knowledge of God, as opposed to a knowledge that is gained by looking at creation and saying, well, this is what God must be like. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I'm someone who enjoys metaphysics quite a bit. I really like to use the Thomistic arguments, but I remember reading in Michael Bird something, in my opinion, in his book, The Gospel of the Lord, talking about the importance Jesus needs to have for our theology. And just, I think I went to sleep and I thought, you know, it's good to have all these doctrines of God. You can defend his omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnibenevolence, and such like that. But we need to make sure that as much as we're doing all that stuff, which is good to have and such, we don't forget that Jesus has to inform our theology. Yes. And Luther made a tremendous distinction, Martin Luther, uh, between what he called the theology of glory and the theology of the cross. Uh And uh, he faulted, and more than faulted, just excoriated the philosophers and uh, even the mystics for trying to see God as he is in himself 
rather than God as he has revealed himself in the suffering of uh, the cross. Mm -hmm. So Luther proposed the theology of the cross, and I think that's something that a lot of us need to become more familiar with, that God is truly known personally through the suffering of Christ. You, know, you talk also about the Trinity in the Old Testament and Judaism, and I'm mm -hmm. sure some Jews listening here could be surprised, like, look, we're Jews. We don't believe in a Trinity, and our Old Testament doesn't teach the Trinity. Now, to an extent, I think they're right. You won't find the explicit teaching of the Trinity in the Old Testament. But do you find some hinting, at least, of a Trinity in the Old Testament? Oh, I, what I find interesting is that uh, in the... Uh in the Second Temple period, the rabbis, uh, uh, in many cases, virtually hypostasized uh, the Word of God and the uh, and the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there have been books written by those who were Jews uh, that uh, show that uh, this was not it was not uncommon to talk of. God and uh, the Son and the Spirit, uh, though not in not in explicitly Trinitarian terms, but of but these aspects of God in the uh, in the Second Temple period, and it's not until the rise of Christianity that Judaism, uh, I would say, retreats into absolute monotheism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the writings of uh, many of the rabbis. Up through the first century, uh, they are they are thinking of div some kind of diversity in the Godhead, mm. uh, but certainly not thinking of an incarnation. Yeah, I, I think about figures like say in the wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom is described in terms that doing things that God the Father does in the Old Testament, and then you have Philo who speaks of the Logos as a second God, and mm -hmm. even. Centuries later, you have the Jews forming a doctrine of Metatron, an angel who is a lesser Yahweh, and God's name is in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot more complex than what people think uh, uh, absorb just off the surface. Yeah, interestingly, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, in in my book, uh, I give a lot of references to these uh, to these uh, intertestamental. Uh, citations that we're just talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, one we definitely need to touch on is when, in fact, many Jews I think would use to argue against the Trinity, but you'd say no, it it doesn't explicitly argue for, but the Trinity fits right in with that, and that would be the famous Shema: "Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one." Yep, and uh, it's most interesting there because. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Yahweh, our, uh, our Elohim. Yahweh is Echad, which is, uh, which is a term properly translated one, but it is not uh, a word for one that means a, an absolute unity. Uh, it is a word that uh, mean, is often used of a compound unity. So, and uh, on day one, and there was evening and there was morning, one day, you know, one day, two parts. Uh, and uh, Adam and Eve, the two shall become echad, flesh, one flesh. Mm -hmm. but those, uh, and uh, other places in the Pentateuch, the people, you know, the whole mob, rises up with echad voice. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in that case, you know, there are who, who knows how many dozens or hundreds or thousands of people in the mob. But um, uh, Echad is a word that uh, is used often to uh, communicate a compound unity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean a compound unity, but in nowhere uh, uh, is, well, in, in those cases, Yachid is not, uh, is not used, which is another Hebrew word for one, and it does mean an undifferentiated unity. Mm -hmm. And when we get to the New Testament, when we get to 1 Corinthians 8, 
many people who are laymen and read their Bibles might not realize it, but Paul is taking that Shema and going to 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6 and Christianizing it. He's putting Jesus in the divine identity. I think uh, Richard Bauckham and God Crucified does an excellent job showing this. Yes, he does. And Bauckham's work is, is tremendous in showing how it is that, you know, a dozen good Jewish boys could ever worship Jesus as God, as Yahweh. And uh, they see Jesus as fulfilling two key roles that, are, that uh, Yahweh does in the Old Testament. And first off is creation. Bauckham has a tremendous section on that in his book, God Crucified. Mind everyone, you're listening to the uh, Deeper Waters podcast. We've got M. James Sawyer on this week. We're talking about his excellent book, Resurrecting the Trinity. But if you're here next week, you're going to have an interesting sort of eschatological discussion. A few months ago, one of my friends told me about how he was hearing at his church all about how some people are saying there's a lot of signs and the stars and such that are going to be taking place on. Rosh Hashanah this year, September 23rd, 2017, and there was going to be a lot of prophecies being fulfilled and such, and I got home by evening, thought, I don't know enough about this from an astronomical perspective, but I know who would, and I write my friends at Reasons to Believe and see if Hugh Ross has anything for that. Well, Hugh Ross has agreed to come on the show and talk about what's going on here, and if there's any prophetic significance, so if you're wondering... If there's any big astronomical signs for Rosh Hashanah this year, Hugh Ross will be my guest again next week talking about that. For now, let's get back to M. James Sawyer and his book, uh, Resurrecting the Trinity. So, you know, what I'm wondering here is that many times in the Gospels, the disciples are not known for brilliance. They are very, very <laughs> clueless. About yeah. many things. They look at Jesus. Like, who who is this guy? What's going on with him? Mm -hmm. and such. Uh, when do you think it was that it fully dawned on them that this guy, this Jesus, is part of a divine identity, as it were? Was it for resurrection? And if so, why? Uh, now, of course, Jesus makes statements before you know, before his crucifixion. Uh, you know the. Father, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and you know, and He stills the winds and the waves, His miracles and all. Uh, though I don't believe that there is a clear understanding mm -hmm. uh, in the minds of the disciples until the resurrection. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just—it's not something that they, as Jews. Uh, good monotheistic Jews uh, were uh, they didn't have the categories to think in this and it is only at the resurrection uh, that uh, you see worship of Jesus in the sense uh, like uh, well with Thomas in, uh, in John you know uh, where he he is the skeptic and he when he sees the risen Christ and sees the, um, you know, his the wounds in his hands and his side. You know, he falls down and says, "My Lord and my God." Mm -hmm. and clearly, uh, you see it there, and then you see from the very beginning of the Book of Acts a clear understanding of the disciples that Jesus is Lord and God. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see that understanding uh, in the Gospels. Right. 
Now, I think it's important for people to know that if you're looking at this from a historical perspective, that probably one of the best defenses of what's known as the early high Christology would be Larry Hurtado, with a book such as Lord Jesus Christ, or for a lighter version, How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hurtado is a great work. Yeah. Some great work. And as has Bauckham. Mm -hmm. Bauckham has done some incredible work, too, in that area. Yeah, we had on the show here you know, to talk about their book, How God Became Jesus. We had three of the authors, uh, Charles here, Chris Tilling, and Michael Bird, all together. And something I've said about that, about uh, the book that replied to your Ehrman's How God Became Jesus, is that Ehrman barely mentions Hurtado twice. He never once interacts with Bauckham at all. And mm. I, I see that this is just something I see with Ehrman a lot of times. He does not interact with his best critics out there. Yeah. Well, I, I have never met Ehrman. Uh, my good friend Dan, Dan Wallace uh -huh. uh, debated him many times. And yeah. you know, Bart and Dan are the two top American textual critics in the world, uh, the two top, two of the top textual critics in the world, and uh, they are the two t uh, American uh, textual critics that are way up, that are up in that rarefied atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Now, when we do get to the epistles of the New Testament, we do see a whole lot more on the deity of Christ and such. Yes, um, absolutely. Colossians 1, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we see Jesus as the... Uh, Creator and sustainer uh, of of all creation, and we see in Philippians two the hymn, and that uh, God has given him the name that is above every name. And what is the name? Mm -hmm. Name of yeah. Jesus, Yahweh. Yeah. yeah, that that the historical person of Jesus Christ is a full participant mm -hmm. in deity and uh, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that uh, Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bauckham, you know, says of course that Jesus uh, participates uh, in two of the uh, prerogatives of Yahweh and uh, one of them is, of course, that the pre-existent Christ participates in creativity. That uh, you know that he is named as the creator. Mm -hmm. He participates in the unique sovereignty of Yahweh, and we see that very clearly in Ephesians one twenty through twenty-three, and then I, then again I mentioned the, the Ephesians two passages as well. Mm -hmm. I find something interesting about a lot of these passages, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, and 1 Corinthians 8, that in these passages, the language is always consistent. Mm -hmm. The Father is the Creator, but Jesus is the one through whom things are created. I mean, that's a Jew putting Jesus directly in line with wisdom theology in the yes. Old Testament. Yes, very, very definitely. And uh, there was much, much speculation as to the nature of, of wisdom. And this was one of the things that was hypostasized, or virtually hypostasized by the intertestamental Jews, mm -hmm. Jewish rabbis. Now, yeah, the, the Jews also emphasized the holiness of God. And in your book, you also indicate that maybe because of how we've misunderstood the Trinity, the holiness of God is something we've misunderstood. Yes, because we think of we think of holiness as primarily in terms of morality. Right. Uh, whereas in the Old Testament, the idea of holiness was. Uh, set apartness and transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I took Hebrew, uh, our Hebrew professor had done a an extensive word study 
on the concept of holiness in the Old Testament. And uh, he pointed out that in the Old Testament, you have things like uh, pots and pans and prostitutes described as holy. And certainly there's nothing moral to do with a pot and a pan, and certainly nothing, you know, holy in the sense, in the moral sense, with reference to a prostitute. So there's something different going on with uh, the Old Testament understanding of holiness. And it is basically Tertullian who uh, labored in the first several decades of uh, the third century. If I remember correctly, he died, what, in about 240? Somewhere in that vicinity. But Tertullian was a uh, converted lawyer. Uh, in fact, it was he that coined the term Trinity. Mm-hmm. But uh, And he was a great apologist and a defender of the faith. But he, as a lawyer, framed Western theology in terms of uh, Roman jurisprudence. Mm-hmm. Those were the categories that he used and he expressed his theology in. And that has set the Western church on that, on that path down to this day. You know, we think in the legal terms, as opposed to the East, uh, which spoke Greek, not Latin, uh, they have always used profoundly relational concepts rather than legal concepts to, uh, to express uh, the relationship of God with God. You know, uh, I also think one of the false views we have of holiness is we view holiness, in fact, as something boring, as it were. When we think of someone being holy, we think of someone who spends hours every day in somber prayer, not smiling at all, or anything like that. And holiness seems like a put-off to many of us, Finn. Mm-hmm. Where's the fun in that? Right. <laughs> and and that, that's, that's just such a misunderstanding, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is a profound misunderstanding. Uh, uh, certainly... Jesus was utterly holy, mm-hmm. and sinners flocked to him. Mm-hmm. He was not put off by by the sin of sinners. It was those who were self consciously holy that separated themselves and condemned the sinners that uh, drew Jesus' ire. And we also have to remember Jesus went to parties, and in fact, at many of these parties, prostitutes were there. Yep, that's right. And the Pharisees tried to set him up. You know, for example, the woman who uh, poured out the the ointment, the the fragrance, uh, the perfume, mm-hmm. and uh, anointed Jesus with it, and. Uh, and others uh, who who were, as you said, prostitutes, were there. And the Pharisees said, hey, were always saying, if he is a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is, you know, and he wouldn't associate. But Jesus uh, associated with the outcasts of society, and they flocked to him. It was those who had something to uh, something to protect that that, uh, that pushed him away. You think this is something also that led to the kind of Marcionite heresy because people are, would look and say, well, you know, here you see God in the Old Testament. It looks like all he's doing is smiting down anyone who disagrees with him any time. And yet when Jesus shows up, we don't see that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Marcion uh, also, I mean, he was radically anti-Jewish. Mm-hmm. And his one contribution to us is he spurred the church to define the New Testament canon. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, another, another plug before you go on, like, for one of the books that you helped contribute to, Reinventing Jesus, has yes. a great section on that. But go on. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, Marcion bought into uh, a lot of philosophical ideas that were, that were contrary to the uh, biblical uh, portrayal of Jesus. Mm-hmm. 
And yet today there is still a lot of that going on because I don't know how many times I've been in debates, especially with atheists and such, about the morality of the God of the Old Testament, which we've had Parker Penn and Matthew Flanagan on the show to talk about. Uh -huh. Well, in many cases, I would uh, wonder how much of the Old Testament they've really read and, right. you know, uh, what, uh, if they understand what is, uh, what is going on uh, in God, with God's program, if you will, of, uh, to, you, uh, to create what Thomas Torrance calls a womb for the incarnation that God cannot have Israel intermarrying and uh, applying pagan concepts to himself. Uh, uh, he, he is utterly separate, and uh, he lays down the law there. He basically lays, he, he creates, if you will, a... Uh, hmm, what's the word I want here? Um, he creates a culture for them in in the law that is to separate them from the surrounding paganism and inculcate uh, the concepts that will be needed to understand uh, what the incarnation is all about when Christ finally comes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's a lot of de debate and discussion going on in that area right now. Um, and just looking at, uh, you know, exactly how are we to understand the portrayal of God in the Old Testament. But, mm -hmm. uh, I've just read a little bit, but I'm not at the point where I am, I feel ready to say anything about what's going on right now. Yeah, and for people wondering about <clears throat> the uh, objections raised, I do recommend going back and listening to those past shows of Paul Capone and Matthew Flanagan. But when you talk about the relationality, of Jesus. I think that's really something important we have to get about the Trinity itself. The Trinity shows us that God at his core is relational. I think it was the ancient Celtics who had a idea of the Trinity is eternally in a dance of love and mm -hmm. mankind is created so that we can be invited to join in the dance. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, we do get that very definitely in Celtic Christianity. Uh, it is uh, implicit, I believe, in the idea of perichoresis, mm -hmm. uh, although the, the metaphor of dance is not used in the patristic period, it comes later. But, this, but the idea that we have of God is you know, a static God sitting on a throne somewhere in a distant heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of perichoresis tells us something very different, that God is, is dynamic, not static. And uh, there is this giving and taking, uh, giving and, I, I don't want to use the word taking, because that sounds uh, egocentric, but giving and receiving. There's a back and forth. A back and forth, a constant dynamic back and forth, into which, and, and in fact, I make reference to this in the book, that Western Christianity has put the holiness of God, understood in a legal moral sense, at the center of God's being, where um, that's not where Eastern Christianity has gone. Eastern Christianity sees the center of God as love. Mm-hmm. Uh, and love, by its very nature, is expansive and creative. Mm -hmm. And uh, that God creates not because uh, he wants to show his glory. Many will take issue with this. But I have become convinced that the idea that God created to show forth his glory implies an implicit need in God. Mm -hmm. And by definition, God is fullness itself. He has no need. But if God is love, love is expansive. Love is created. And he created creation in order to bring 
the creation and bring us into a loving relationship with himself. Mm-hmm. You know, as I'm you know, thinking about moving on, you're saying the closest analogy I can come up to explain it is marriage itself. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have... Uh, it's actually Richard of St. Victor in the 11th or 12th century uh, talks about that, that you cannot have uh, that love for a single, you know, if God is single, is uh, is self- egocentric. And it's as egocentricity, it's not love. Mm-hmm. Uh, love requires two. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but that's the love uh that is shared, but love, for love to be perfected, you need a third, which the first two all love uh, t- together, love the, fir- the third. And that that is his rationale for the necessity of the Trinity. Mind everyone at this point, you're listening to the People Waters podcast. I'm Nick Peters, your host, and everything I do here is supported by people like you. You know, I love to see the comments on iTunes and your, and I encourage you to please leave them how much you love the show, the, the reviews, and such. And it, it gladdens my heart every time. But if you enjoy the show that much, why not take part in what we're doing here? And the way to do that is to go to our website, first off, that's uh, deeperwatersapologetics.com. Now, there's a link there that says, Help Support the Work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. If you click on that link, you'll be, this link within there, you'll be taken to the ministry of Risen Jesus. That is the right place to go to, actually. Mike and Debbie Lacona are my in-laws. They run that ministry. And we help them out with it. And if you want to make a donation, what you do is you go to, to Risen Jesus and you make your donation to them. But then you contact me or my wife, Allie, or Mike or Debbie and say, hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. And they will make sure we get that donation. It will be tax deductible. You can also go on Amazon and buy some of the ebooks that I've written or co-written. Written, I think, directly applies to today, is a, a creed for the ages, the Apostles' Creed and today's Christians, something I wrote on the Apostles' Creed. And co-written, something that we talk about some today, would include defining inerrancy, a look at the doctrine of biblical inerrancy and what it really means. And then books like God and Natural Disasters or Groundless, which looks at Dan Barker. And then, guys, another tip, you know, we are talking about so much about being relational. If you want to be in good relationship with your wife, some of you might have found this out, but women seem to like to get jewelry many times. We have a jewelry store here, as it were. My friend Lena Cluster does the work through Premier Jewelers. Now, you get in touch with me or her and... You buy the item that you want of a jewelry store, and you let us know about it. And whatever you buy of that jewelry store, 25% of it goes to Deeper Waters. So you get jewelry for the lady you love, and you get to donate to a ministry at the same time. And guys, the way I see it is, when you go and buy jewelry, you are buying something, and you get a chance to make up for that screw-up that you recently did, or... You get some insurance to make up for that screw-up that I know you're going to make in the future with them. (laughs) Now, Dr. Sawyer, do you have an organization, charity you'd like to see people donate to? 
Yes, uh, we are uh, Sacred Saga Ministries. Our uh, website is sacredsaga.net. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just warn everyone, I'm in the process of moving the site so, uh, to a new server, so the site is down right now. It should be up again in, in a couple of weeks or so. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to make a donation, uh, you also can go to PayPal and make the donation to mjsawyer.sacredsaga at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And that is also, it is a tax-deductible donation. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get back to the book here. And some of that was on my mind before I went into the uh, commercial break, as it were, to talk about how to donate to the show. It's the, uh, and when I was in Bible college, and I did go to a conservative Bible college, but I remember my systematic theology class very well. And after I started challenging my professor, the other students wanted to always see how long I'd have my hand up before he'd call on me in class. <laughs> I, I think the record was 19 minutes, actually. Everyone else would be called on and I'd be last. And the thing that really got me was when he started talking about creation and said, God created man because he needed someone to love. And I just said, I, I, you know, if that was really true, the smartest thing all of humanity could do is collectively hold God for ransom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that is the basic fallacy, I think. That uh, because I mean, just look look at uh, Acts chapter seventeen. Paul says explicitly, God has no needs in Himself. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need us. Mm -hmm. and you know, I, you kind of have to say that that really botches up the whole Trinity thing. I mean, do we want to thank the followers up there and say, boy, Jesus, it's nice to have you here, but I need to create some humans. You're just not enough for me. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. What can we say? And, and you know, e the eternal Trinity, you know, that uh, from eternity past, God has been Father, Son, and Spirit, and all of a sudden, there's some need, so God decides to create. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't get that. Mm -hmm. Now, looking further into the self-revelation, Jesus, you do have the same about how God, in essence, became one of us. Or, mm -hmm. And I, I think it's pretty amusing that you point to the song. I remember my family and I used to watch the show Joan of Arcadia when it was on. I was pretty curious about that, and it has that song about what if God was one of us, and I mean, you do say your wife was somewhat appalled and offended when she first heard it, mm -hmm. but That's right. then, then after a while, you sort of think, wait, that is what happened, isn't it? It is exactly what happened. God has become one of us in the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. now, and go ahead. He lived lived his life with the same limitations we live our life. He experienced mm -hmm. he experienced uh, much worse than most of us that will ever or that any of us will ever experience because he he experienced the total rejection of humanity. Mm -hmm. He drank drank to the dregs the worst that humanity could do. And still Loved us. You know, that's something that I think can give many of us pause many times because we can think, especially in the apologetics world, like, you know what, we know our Bibles so well. We are very good at detecting error and, and getting rid of all these heresies and such out there, but would we be so eager to do that that if Jesus came today just like he did back then, would we condemn Jesus? Would we say Jesus is, in essence, not acting like Jesus today. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't surprise me if we did. Mm -hmm. You know, God does not do what we think he should do. Mm -hmm. I remember when I lived in Knoxville, we had a, we had a story about one of the professors at my college saying, 
being asked a question. If Jesus came to downtown Knoxville today, where would he go? And the answer is immediately given, he would be down at the bar during happy hour. Yep, that's probably true. Mm-hmm. Now, we do need to take a little excursus like you do in your book, because we've been talking about the great love of God and such. And, of course, it is important to know that God is love. And we've condemned the idea of a distant critical God, such as an Allah. But mm-hmm. there is still that wrath of God that is there. And does that really fit in with the revelation of Jesus? And does that really fit in with the God of love? You have to ask, what is wrath? Mm-hmm. I think one of the best explanations that uh, that I have ever heard uh, is that wrath is saying no to what God loves. Mm-hmm. That uh, you know, we when we are angry with our children, mm-hmm. you know, and we discipline them, or uh, we that does not mean we don't love them at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I believe that properly understood, wrath is an example of God's love in action. Mm -hmm. One one of the ways that love shows itself, uh, rather than uh, just being uh, lashing out and going to destroy, uh, that God's wrath is... uh, Oh, what's the best word here, is for education purposes and to stop, to stop behavior, to stop events that are, uh, that are destroying what he has created mm-hmm. and what he loves. And doesn't this also get into the danger many times of us misunderstanding the Trinity? Because you describe the view that we have of... Uh, Jesus as sort of a divine whipping boy meant to mm. placate the angry God, but God and Jesus are in essence totally different in personality. Yeah, and that is a that is a common conception, and I believe that conception is in error. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I freely admit I'm in, in a minority in the West on that, but in the, the Eastern Church, uh, this is they have never they have never held the idea of an angry, wrathful God that we have held in the West. Mm-hmm. Uh, N.T. Wright tells a story about uh, being at a conference in the Vatican and sitting beside an uh, Eastern uh, Archimandrite, who was a, a high high official in the in the hierarchy of the Eastern Church, and. Uh, I believe he said they were in the Sistine Chapel, and the Sistine Chapel, if you know, has filled with these gorgeous uh, windows. Mm-hmm. And each each window tells a part of the biblical story. And uh, this Archimandrite looked at all the windows around. He says, I understand this, I understand this, and yet all the way around. But he comes to the last window, and it shows uh, hellfire and damnation and, uh, you know, and all of that. And he says, but I don't understand that. That's just not a category that they even think of in the Eastern Church. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, because they view God's, uh, God's love and God's wrath not through the, uh, the lens of punishment that we do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm thinking also that people who think where Jesus... He isn't like that. We had on the show uh, Rodney Reeves and the, I think it was Randy Richards, and uh, David Capes wasn't able to make it, talking about the book of, you know, a book they wrote on Jesus, Jesus Rediscovered, I think, or Rediscovering Jesus. Yeah, Rediscovering Jesus. Mm -hmm. And how they went through, what if, this book was the only source we had about Jesus. And they went and used Revelation as an example. So what if the only thing we knew about Jesus was that found in a book of Revelation? 
Well, if that was true, you would have a Jesus of wrath, definitely. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking that what, what that does for us is that you say, where Jesus isn't like that, but Revelation shows, yes, Jesus deals in judgment just as much as a father does. Uh, yes, there, certainly the images of Jesus in, uh, in Revelation do mm -hmm. deal with judgment. Yeah. But what, what is the framework that we understand that in, hmm. is the question. Right. It's not, it's not just what's on the page, it's the interpretive presuppositions that we bring to the text. Right. And a lot of our text is that, you know, this kind of stuff is stuff that a lot of our culture is very much, we, we think it's distant from God to judge, to do violence or anything like that. It's really, we have bad theology, don't we? Uh, in some, in some aspects, yes. Yeah. Now, you also talk about Jesus being the sacrificial one, and you've, uh, you point to, for instance, being a big Lord of the Rings fan, mm -hmm. and Gandalf, as many of us know, is meant to be a figure of Jesus, and you look at the confrontation with Balrog mm -hmm. as an example of Gandalf being the Jesus figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the same is true, of course, in uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with Aslan. You know, it is a self-sacrifice to save, uh, to save those that, uh, who are loved, rather than the wrath, being, uh, the wrath of God being poured out mm -hmm. to, to judge those. You also talk about how the Incarnation is an act of love. And one thing I'd like to stress on here is that we often think of the death of Jesus paying our redemption and such. And that's definitely true. But you look and say, what if the whole life of Jesus was meant to be looked as redemption? Because if all the death wasn't even, hey, let Herod slaughter him as a baby, and by golly, there's redemption right there. But oh, by, by the more... way, Go ahead. by the way, uh, that is not not something I I have said. That was right. that was John Calvin's view. Right. right. Uh, saying it, it's in your book. Yeah, it is in my book, but that's not original yeah. with me. That was mm -hmm. Calvin's understanding, and uh, that is also an Eastern understanding as well. And goes back, if I remember correctly, to Gregory of Nazianzus. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, we do need to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus, but many times we miss out on the life of Jesus. That we, that's why I think we spend so much time with Pauline epistles in the West because they focus so much on the doctrine that we're safe <laughs> and familiar with. But we come to the Gospels, and we're not sure what to do. Some people, are, for instance, I've said the Gospels are kind of often treated like for chips and dip before you get to the main course in Paul. <laughs> yeah, if if we don't go directly to the main course. Right. Right. I know that my seminary education was very, very Pauline-centric. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, we did just a brief survey of the Gospels in our uh, English Bible class, but all of our, all of our exegesis uh, was basically in the Pauline material. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this kind of also make us get the point that, you know, we know Jesus came to be a ransom for many, we know he came to die for our sins, but he also came to live, and he came to show us who God is, and that yep. how we are meant to live in relation to God. I mean, if you want to be Pauline, where he says, imitate me as I imitate Jesus, and you're not going to be able to do that unless you know how Jesus lived. That's right. God had to become flesh mm -hmm. uh, for us to know him. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, we would create uh, gods and project the idea and worship, worship the God that we have created. Mm -hmm. And if we uh, 
were to talk about, again, the god of the philosophers, I, I think I'd probably agree with Aquinas, who'd say that uh, if you were looking at the pagans, probably no one got closer than Aristotle did, but without God revealing himself directly, they're still even a whole lot lacking in Aristotle's view of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but uh, Aristotle, of course, gives us the philosophical proofs, but the, the philosophical proofs do not reveal a personal God. Mm -hmm. We should definitely also talk about how in the sixth chapter of your book, it's a chapter about the Holy Spirit, which mm -hmm. is pretty fitting because the Holy Spirit is sometimes seen as the forgotten member of the Trinity. Yep. And I, it, it could be for a lot of us, you know, we think in the Protestant condition that if you talk a lot about the, uh, the Holy Spirit, where somebody might think you're charismatic, for instance. <laughs> yep, uh, right. And I, I think a lot of us, we don't know what to think about the Holy Spirit. I mean, we, we can go back to the language of the King James, for instance, about the Holy Ghost and such. Like, where, what is this Holy Spirit? Exactly. Is that a question? Yeah, I mean, how, how are we supposed to understand the Holy Spirit? Well, first off, uh, the Holy Spirit is, of course, the third member of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the Holy Spirit is one who has been uh, called the shy member of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, he works in the background. He reflects, he reflects away from himself to by Jesus. He facilitates relationship. Mm -hmm. But it's not an impersonal spirit. It is a personal, uh, it is a, a personal relationship. But, uh, uh, and as fully personal as the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. But he, as I said, is the one that, is in the background, but if we look through the epistles of Paul, the Holy Spirit is all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, we even see the Spirit of God spoken of many, many times throughout the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And we see him in the Gospels as coming upon Jesus at his baptism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as uh, one of my theologian friends calls us the a divine family reunion where <laughs> 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 you the, the one place in the New Testament the one event in the New Testament where you have all three members of the Trinity coming to get together you know, this is my son with whom I am well pleased the spirit coming in the form of the dove and and you know Jesus being baptized all you know all that goes together at once but the Spirit, if we read John 3, the Spirit is not one who can be captured, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spirit goes where he will, where and, what, and you can't predict, but it's, at the same time, it is the Spirit that gives life. Mm -hmm. As I said, uh, the forgotten member of the Trinity, yes. The shy member of the Trinity, yeah, that's a. I think that's a good, uh, good description. Mm. But at the same time, uh, you know, the well, both the Eastern Church and the Catholic Church see the Spirit being give uh, at work in the sacraments, and which, which is something that we as Protestants generally don't see. But um, to try to, we can describe what the Spirit does, you know, we can make a list of his activities, but that we don't get a concrete feel for who he is. It's just because the spirit, by definition, is elusive. Mm -hmm. It's like wind. And it's very, very interesting that this Greek word for spirit is, uh, and the Hebrew words for spirit, both uh, can be translated spirit or wind. There's there's a wildness. There's an unpredictability. You can't, uh, you can't say, because the spirit, 
uh, what we know of the Spirit can't be really reduced to a doctrine because the Spirit is thoroughly existential. Mm. And something that is existential cannot be successfully reduced to to simple doctrinal statements. Mm. So, how is it that we're supposed to view the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives today? Because I, I really think there's a whole lot of misunderstanding on this one, because there are mm-hmm. so many people who think that, you know, if I feel anything or such, well, that's the Holy Spirit trying to tell me something and such. How, how yeah. should we view the Holy Spirit in our lives today? Well, certainly, um, the if I feel something, that's the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, the Holy Spirit did communicate uh, in the book of Acts. Did, did the Holy Spirit's work stop at the close of the canon? Uh, I'm a church historian, historical theologian, and I've uh, read in the early in the early centuries this the Spirit's work continued for you know very very visibly for centuries, and you read even atheist historians are not going to who don't try to uh, say that. Uh, these things are made up. They just say, this is what the documents tell us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does seem, though, that as the church did become more organized and structured, the work of the Spirit went into the background. Mm-hmm. And this is exactly what the Montanist uh controversy in the late uh, the late uh, second century was about because Montanus was trying to bring the Holy Spirit to the front again as, as opposed to the uh, hierarchy and uh, organization that they were already beginning to see in the late uh, in the late 100s mm-hmm. but he you know if I read scripture right you know the Holy Spirit is not on vacation he is working, and uh, one of the, the problems that we have is that we are children of the Enlightenment. Mm-hmm. And as children of the Enlightenment, even as Christians, we are materialists. And when we are looking, uh, when we are looking at the world through a materialistic lens, we do not easily see the work of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is not not a nice little <laughs> package that I'm giving you here, but just mm-hmm. that the, the the Spirit is is the much more undefined, if you will, yeah. member of the Trinity who likes a facilitate relationship, who draws attention away from himself and places it in, shines on Christ, and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what you're talking about also does apply definitely to all the ancient church, because I mean, when you look at the Nicene Creed, it seems like the Holy Spirit's practically an add-on there. It's like, hey, that's not, let's put in something about the Holy Spirit here. We believe in him, too. There's not much but- definition beyond that. Well, the reason for that is not because they didn't believe in the Holy Spirit, but the they were uh, the Nicene Creed was in in effect an ad hoc document mm-hmm. that it the Council of Nicaea was called to define the relationship between the Father and the Son, in uh, which the controversy was Arianism, right. and no one was talking about the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we get to the 381, to the Council of Constantinople, there is an expansion, not a great expansion, but there is an expansion more than one line uh, about what the Holy Spirit does. Mm-hmm. But again, uh, the Holy Spirit is in the background. Mm-hmm. Well, if we were to go to the church today and see them living the Trinity with the resurrected Trinity, as it were, how do you think our church services would be different? The first thing that comes to mind 
is that uh, there would be there would be more living out of relationality mm-hmm. uh, within the church, uh, and that even our even our sermons would be far less uh, heady. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'd, you'd be coming away with something that more than, uh, you know, here's this point, this point, this point, this point. Now go apply it this way. You know, the American church, by and large, is very rationalistic. Mm-hmm. And hey, I'm an academic. I'm a rationalist, too. <laughs> uh, but but I, I believe that... Uh, that we would be more involved in creating community, that participating in the lives of each other, and being more outwardly focused into the world rather than being the holy huddle that comes together on Sunday morning and uh, you know, uh, does, does not interface with the issues of the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Holy Spirit in the early church was manifest on the front lines. Mm-hmm. And where the gospel was going, the spirit was working mightily. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think we see a lot of that going on today. For instance, with uh, Craig Keener's book *Miracles*, which you've been interviewing mm-hmm. on, where he's talking about that many Westerners they go to in a church in Africa, such that they're going to pray for healing, they ask the Americans to leave. Yep, because Americans don't believe we are rationalists and we don't believe in the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that comes from, from our own history. Mm-hmm. And that some um, part of our worldview and our, we give lip service to the fact that miracles happen, but we don't expect them to happen. Right. Uh, and we will try to find any other explanation mm-hmm. uh, when a miracle does happen. That's the rationalism that most of us fall victim to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm thinking right now, for instance, I'm sure you know about the story. My friend Nabil Qureshi, who's got the stage four cancer right now, and so many people are praying for him. And I wonder how many of us are praying and praying, but saying, yeah, but it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think perhaps the prayer we ought to be uh, praying is, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm. Uh, that would be a good one for us to pray. No. Uh, because uh, I think there's a lot more unbelief in us than there probably was in that father who was asked, asked Jesus to heal us. <laughs> to heal, you know. Mm-hmm. Because... Again, we come back to a distant God. Again, a God who hasn't revealed himself in Jesus as much because we think, yeah, Jesus did miracles back then in those days, and he was showing what the kingdom was like and such, but yeah, that was then, and this is now. We can't expect miracles today. Right. And uh, you're right that you do go to Africa and in some of the places where the gospel is uh, moving rapidly and powerfully, and you do the miracles, and you just you can't deny them. Yeah, I, I've heard some people in China even saying, "Hey, the Book of Acts is taking place right here." Mm-hmm. Well, uh, so we, are, we are near the time of the end of this debate, folks. We do need to, this interview. I'm sorry, this interview. So we need to start wrapping things up. And your book it, it is Resurrecting Maternity. It's on sale right now if anyone wants to know on Amazon. The Kindle version is nine ninety nine. The paperback is ten thirty nine. It was just recently released to the public, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, uh, the release date was supposed to be early July. They actually got it out in the middle of June. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's one of the advantages of doing a show like this is you do get the books. In, in advance, you can go through them and be ready to talk about them when they come out. Um, do you have a blog, a website, where people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more? 
Uh, yes, as I said, my my website is down right now. We're in the process of moving it to a new server. It's Sacred Saga, one word, sacredsaga.net. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have uh, any final thoughts you'd like to leave today for the Deeper Waters audience? Well, uh, my... I believe that if we come face to face with the reality of the Trinity, rather than just being an academic abstraction, it has the potential to revolutionize mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, that is my challenge. Study the Trinity. Come come face to face with who God is and how he relates to us mm -hmm. it is it is truly um, uh, life changing it's a whole lot more than beating up Jehovah's Witnesses isn't it uh, yes it is mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the book, we're talking uh, about a, we're not talking about a theological abstraction we're talking about personal realities here we're talking about God himself mm -hmm. that's right mm -hmm. I like mine and one again. My book is Resurrection of Trinity. It is a great book. I've gone through it. Uh, just like pretty much all, nearly all of our books that I'll talk about on the show. And, uh, Dr. Sawyer, thank you for coming on. Hopefully we'll see you back here again sometime. Well, I'd love to come back. Thank you very much, Nick. And I like to remind everyone, next week we're going to be talking about Rosh Hashanah. Is there anything prophetic happening in the sky with Rosh Hashanah? Hugh Ross will be my guest to talk about that. For now, I'm Nick Peters, and I'm signing off.